I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman P Peters, on behalf of the 700,000 District of Columbia residents, including 30,000 veterans, I thank you for holding and for being an original co-sponsor uh, uh, for holding this hearing and for being an original co-sponsor of the District of Columbia Statehood Bill. This hearing is of historic significance because it is only the second Senate hearing on our DC Statehood Bill in the nation's history. In the last year, the House of Representatives has twice passed the state, D, our DC statehood bill. In 1993, when I first came to the House of Representatives, I got the first ever House vote on DC statehood. But the bill failed because the House had a very different composition then. Prior to last year, Neither chamber of Congress had ever passed the D.C. statehood bill in the nation's history. Senator Carper, I particularly thank you for, for sponsoring our D.C. statehood bill and for being a champion for D.C. in the Senate where we have no representation. Following in the footsteps of Senator Joel Lieberman. Under your leadership, the DC statehood bill has 45 Senate co-sponsors, which is the greatest number of Senate co-sponsors of the bill in the nation's history. President Biden strongly supports DC statehood, our DC statehood bill, and is the first president to put the full weight of the presidency behind the bill in the nation's history. 54%, and that's a growing number, 54% of the American people, more than half of the American people, support DC statehood, according to a recent very detailed poll this is the greatest support for D.C. statehood in the nation's history. Congress has both the moral obligation and the constitutional authority to pass our D.C. statehood bill. The country was founded on the principles of no taxation without representation and consent of the government, but D.C. residents are taxed without representation and cannot consent to the laws under which they, as American citizens, must live. The state of Washington, D.C. would consist of 66 of the 68 square miles of the present day federal district. The federal district would be two square miles and Congress would retain control over it as required by the Constitution. The DC statehood bill clearly complies with the Constitution, including the admissions clause, the district clause, and the 23rd Amendment. Those who believe the bill is, is constitutional need only rely on the plain text of the Constitution. A group of very distinguished Law professors and scholars from America's top law schools have sent a definitive analysis of the bill's constitutional, constitutionality to the House and Senate leadership. You already have that, so I don't believe I need to ask that it be admitted to the record. The admissions clause gives Congress the authority to admit new sta states. All 37 New states were admitted by Congress by majority vote. No state was admitted by constitutional amendment, and no state would have to consent to the admission of the state of Washington, D.C. 
The district clause gives Congress plenary authority over the federal district and establishes a maximum size of the federal district, 100 square miles. It does not establish a minimum size or a location of the federal district. Congress reduced the size of the federal district by 30% in 1846. The 23rd Amendment allows the federal district to participate in the Electoral College, but does not establish a minimum size or location of the federal district. Therefore, the bill complies with the 23rd Amendment. Nevertheless, the bill would repeal the enabling act for the 23rd Amendment, and the 23rd Amendment itself would be repealed quickly. The Constitution does not establish any prerequisites for new states, but Congress generally has considered three, population and resources, support for statehood, and commitment to democracy. The state of Washington, D.C. would meet all three. DC, D.C.'s population is larger than the population of two states. D.C. pays more federal taxes per capita, and I will repeat that one. The residents I represent pay more taxes per capita than any state and pay more federal taxes right now than 21 states. D.C.'s federal domestic product is larger than 17 states. In 2016, 86% of D.C. residents voted for statehood. D.C. residents have been petitioning for voting representation in the Congress and local autonomy for, for all of its 220 years of existence from the moment this became the capital of the United States. Congress does have a choice. It can continue to exclude D.C. residents from the democratic process, forcing them to watch from the sidelines as Congress votes on federal and D.C. laws and to treat them, in the words of Frederick Douglass, as aliens, not citizens but subjects, or it can live up to our nation's founding principles and pass our D.C. statehood bill. Again, Chairman Peters and Senator Carper, thank you for your leadership on this bill. I look forward to continuing to work with you and your colleagues to enact the D.C. statehood bill this Congress. Thank you again. Congresswoman uh, Holmes-Darden, thank you uh, for your statement. And again, thank you uh, for your leadership.